Hello, Nana here. Welcome back to TIS 100. So, in this episode we will be talking about the signal multiplier. And it's a fun one. So, this one definitely benefited from me looking at it twice. So I had a brief look at it yesterday evening for about half an hour. I, I just noodled around a bit with the problem and then I just let it wait and no, just contemplated the problem for a good night of sleep and then I sat down and the ideas kept coming. So uh, that's uh, definitely a uh, valid strategy for solving the more complex puzzles. Just take multiple days and you will get to a good solution and the solutions will get better. So uh, I've got a couple of different approaches to show you. So let's start with the one I started with first. All right, so back up, what's the problem that we're solving this time? So this is a signal multiplier. So we have A and B, they will both give us a number and we have to multiply the numbers and then send it out. So it's pretty straightforward you would expect, right? So we get a one, we get an eight, one times eight makes eight. We get a four, we get a one, four times one makes four. Zero and four, well, zero times anything makes zero. So that's obviously zero, eight times four, 32 and so forth. Funny thing is, if you look at the instruction set, it has add, it has subtract, it never actually has multiply. So we have to do multipl multiplication by hand. So the method of how you add, uh, of how you multiply two things, is basically you decompose it into a series of additions. So if you have three times five, I've written it out here, then you could also see it as, okay, that's five plus five plus five, because this is three times five, that makes 15. All right. So, how exactly do we do this? The big picture idea that I've come with is, we take the multiplier. So let's say it starts at three. In this case, three times five. Okay, so we start at three, we initialize it, then we check if it's zero, we are done. Otherwise, we tell the multiplicant that we want at least one copy of the number. And we send it down to be added somewhere down below. We'll get into the details of that later. So this one keeps track of how many times we do the addition. So that this is basically a counter that counts down until we reach a zero. While this one is the one that's responsible for actually sending out the numbers downstairs stream. And then we do the addition over here. Okay, so let's uh, take it step by step. Let's first focus on this note. How do we build a countdown? Well, we start, we initialize it. We take the number from, uh, from the input and we store it in the accumulator. And then if it's zero, we are done. That's just a, an early termination check because if we do zero times four, we are already done. There is no need to actually tell this one to send a four down because we never actually need to. So we do a check. Then we move on. So we move the number one to the right. In this case, I use zero and one as control signals. Zero means we're done and one means you can emit another number. This could be anything positive because here I'm just checking if it's a zero or not. Uh, could even be a negative number actually. So after we tell this one to send a number downstream for addition, we subtract one from the number that's an accumulator. So in this case, for the three times five, we send one to the right, then we subtract one from the three, so that makes two. So that means we, we told this one to emit the first five, and after that, the counter goes down because we still have these two fives remaining to output. So we subtracted it, and then we check. As long as it's not zero, we go on next. And because the input is always a positive or a zero, it's never a negative number, we know we're not gonna get a negative number and have to do weird things with it. Because if there were negative numbers in the input, this would not be valid. Just, uh, that's just something that's uh, a boundary condition of the solution. Okay, so we keep looping until we actually uh, reduce the number down to zero, at which point we will not 
loop again we go to done and then we send okay we send a zero to the right to indicate this one that we are done and we want to cycle into the next number okay so and after this we loop back and we grab the next number and we start emitting ones and zeros and decrementing it so this is a very simple self-complaint countdown timer so to say okay the multiplicant it, this is a bit more code so we start we take the number from up and we start in the accumulator then we save it so we copy it to back ak and back are then the same okay then the main loop we take a number from left so that's the multiplier that's going to be either a one or a zero so we store it in the accumulator so that's also why we took the number here that we need to send out and we saved it to back because we want to keep it because we need to send it out every time we get a one from the left side all right so we just took the a number from the left side we stored it in ak and then we're gonna check if it's equal to zero we are done because then this one is done counting down and we need to cycle that otherwise we fall through to the next label in which case we swap so the v number that we need to send out we cycle it back so it becomes ak then we copy it uh, or we move it actually from ak down but move is basically a copy so we send the value down and then we swap it back so the number goes back into back so it is safe and then we have an inlined version of the main loop. So this, these two instructions are main. I've inlined them here for efficiency. It adds one extra instruction to the solution, but it also makes the solution slightly faster. And in this case, slightly faster is always a good thing. Uh, and actually considering how often these loops run, inlining all the, all the loops you can actually makes a difference. So briefly jumping to the side, just inlining all the, I think this might actually be the only one that's inlined. Inlining it, it adds one cycle, but it increases the runtime speed by nearly 150 cycles. So that's pretty huge for one extra instruction. Okay, that was our brief aside. Let's go back. So we just sent out a number to the to down and we swapped it back. Then we have a inlined main function. So we take once again a number from the left, store it in the accumulator, and then if it's not a zero, basically if it's a one, then we move on to the next to send out the number we have saved another time. So if that stops being the case, if we get a zero, then we send a negative one downstairs. And in this case, normally, if you've watched my previous videos, I tend to use a zero as a control signal to, to indicate that we are done. Um, just basically like I'm doing here. In this case, um, I sent a negative one, and that is because the inputs will never contain negative numbers. And if I use a zero, I will get a problem whenever input B is a zero, and that actually is the case on numerous occasions. So I can't use it as a control signal because then the program will get confused between data and control signals. Um, no. I need to send some value through so that's how it goes so that's why it's a negative okay so this one is now also explained move over then we slowly move over to the next one and this all it does is take the number we get put it in the accumulator and then we send it down and then if it's less than zero basically if it's negative one then we jump back to the main otherwise we send out the number again and this has to do with how I've built my sum function. This, this node is the thing that actually does all the, the summing. So, and it starts out with a check. So we take a number uh, from up, we put it in the accumulator, and then we see what it is. If it's less than zero, so if it's this negative one that we got here, then we know we are done. Otherwise, we know we need to add a number. But the thing is, if you want to do a check here, and we want to store a saved function in back or the saved value in back we can't actually perform an addition operation from arc to back so we need a second copy of the value from the upstairs node and that's why this line is in here uh, why we emit the value a second time if there was a function to say add the value in arc to back 
uh, then this could just have been a simple move up down because then we could have done all the evaluation here but because that instruction doesn't exist we need to work around it in this way and make it slightly more complicated okay so if it's less than zero we are done if it's not the case then we need to add the number we got to the new number that we just get here uh, because the list always starts at zero we don't have to initialize it we can do that when we clean up when we're done so in this case we just swap the buck value into ACK then we add the value that we get from up so that's a second copy of the value that we know is not a negative one so that's just uh, another one of the B values we add that to the sum and then we save it so we copy it over and it uh, gets stored in buck at this point you can also use a swap uh, but doesn't really matter. I mean, you are going to override ACK anyway. So both instructions work fine. And after that, we jump back to the check. Okay, so then that is going to repeat and repeat and repeat until we are actually done. Um, also, here I use a jump. Most of the time, if you use a jump instruction, and the jump instruction, uh, it, it jumps to a label that has one or two instructions which end with a conditional jump. Oftentimes you can inline that function. So I actually tried it inlining the check. But the thing is, this is a jump of less than zero. And the reason is because both a zero and positive values are valid values. So in order to replace it, the opposite of a jump if less than zero, it's not a jump if greater than zero. It's a jump if greater than or equal to zero. So you need to replace it with two instructions, uh, a j equal to z and a jump if greater than z, which kind of defeats the purpose because then you have two checks in a row. So for now, I just went with uh, a jump and it's less efficient, but it's, it's consistently less efficient. Okay, so when we are done, we swap the values again. So the sum is always stored in back. So that's why we should be swap it out. Then we store the, the we send the value from ACK, we send it down to the output. Then we put a zero in ACK and we save it to clear the buffer. And then we loop back and we are done. So this is a reasonably straightforward implementation. It doesn't do anything fancy. I mean, there are two stack nodes on the sides. And we're not using them. And this is also the minimum number of nodes that you could get away with for nodes. It's very compact. So uh, let's just let it run. You notice it's really, really busy here. Because this, you no, know, it has to do a lot of logic of, of just swapping through numbers, sending things out. So this is idle only 3% of the time. This is idle uh, 8 or 9% of the time. This is idle 1% of the time. So everything is really, really busy. This is the only one that's kind of not doing a lot well and uh, let's uh, accelerate it a bit further so this is uh, almost 1400 cycles so it actually takes a while to run four instructions with a 30 uh, of four nodes with 30 instructions so that's the the final version i got to with this uh, solution so i started optimizing it so this one i mean i was thinking hey there are stack note memory nodes here Let's see if we can use them for something. So remember I was using ACK and BAC and I was swapping a lot between them for keeping the sum in BAC or actually I was doing the summing down here, but I was keeping the sum in BAC and I was just swapping between them. So I figured, okay, but what if we just push the sum into the stack memory? Rather than doing a lot of swapping, you can just, uh, Initially, we move a zero to the right, because then the sum is set to zero. And whenever we get a number from upstairs, that, because these two nodes are basically the same. So we just focus on the changes over here. So we take a number, we put it in an accumulator. Then if it's less than zero, we are done, because once again, we emit a negative one as a control signal. And if that's not the case, then we add a number. So all we do is we just add the value on the right to our accumulator after which we move the accumulator back to the right so we put a zero in the stack then we get a number that goes into the accumulator 
then we add the number from here to the accumulator and we push it back. So now the first time a number comes through, which is going to be an 8, then now we push a 0 in, we get an 8, 8 in the accumulator, 8 plus 0. Well, that becomes 8, we push the 8 in. So if another 8 would come by, then we have an 8 here, we add the 8 from here, becomes 16 and we push it back and we keep iterating and iterating and iterating until we are done. Until we get a negative 1, after which point we have a negative 1 in the accumulator. So we just jump over to the to the done. And at that point we just ignore the negative 1 here. And we just take the value from the right and we send it straight down. So no, there's no arc buck swapping, there's no adding, there's no difficulty. It's just really straightforward. You keep the sum in here and for the rest you're just checking the value. And either you add it or you take it out. And after some optimization... This basically ran at the similar performance characteristics, 1389 versus 1397, uh, but it uses four less instructions. So this is, in terms of instructions, this is a slightly simpler solution that's also more efficient. So it's basically, you could say this is superior in all regards. And just to have it run, ta -da. And this is actually a worst case. I mean, if you have a look at the number of the, the tests it did with some random data, in a more ideal situation, it actually ran in 1270 cycles. But the thing is, it always counts the negative ones, so it can expose you to just different types of situations to really stress test your design. So this is the score you get. Okay, and then we get to the last one. Uh, like warning ahead, this one looks complicated. Yeah, 80 instructions this is uh, i think this is one of my most complicated designs yet but it's worth it so this is uh, version four i i tend to anytime i try a different approach i increase the the version so i had a version three which basically only used the middle lanes and version four expanded on version three by adding a side lane so it's it, it's actually it's less complicated than it looks. So let's dive into it because this is I don't actually use the the stack memory nodes anymore. This is uh, a like an advanced version of version one rather than of the version two. So I went back and I figured, okay, can I? Um, Oh, let's actually get back to the to the to the list just to uh, show for comparison. Okay, so in this design, there are three nodes that do work, and they all have a function. So this one counts down. It counts down from the first number till zero, and it's done. And this is the one that tells you how many times you need to add the other number. And this node does the addition. So this is a countdown, this is the addition, and this one basically just makes sure that the proper number of, uh, that, that you emit the number, the proper number of times. It, it's the link in between. So I was thinking, what if you are able to combine the logic of these two in the same node? Because um, in that case, you only need two nodes for all this logic. Because there's a lot of uh, instructions dedicated to just communicating between the two and there is some space here and especially because no this this is a uh, there's some space here so you could uh, move it uh, on the same line I've inlined the function here that I could just not inline and get another cycle back another uh, line back so there is some space to make it more compact same for this so I could potentially you know muffle it in into one single node and then you only have two nodes to account for and in this case I'm using the the, the stack here but the, the logic for addition oh, I've in the version one, um, I've also done it in a single node. Uh, it, it is doable in a single node. So let's go back to version four. So this one, it does all the busy work for deciding how many times to emit the numbers and what numbers to emit by itself. And it does that by keeping basically the, the A value and the B value, it keeps one in AC and it keeps one in BAC. So AC is the one 
that you count down on. And then every time ak is still greater than zero, you just swap it out, send the value in buck downstairs, and then you swap it back. And that's all there is to it. So this all happens now in line. And once ak reaches zero, we send a negative one downstairs. And this one uses ak and buck to basically just, just control itself. And this one sends the number out twice in case it needs to be added. So that logic, it's now more compact. So rather than needing three nodes, I need two nodes. So the very first version had the, the logic that's basically contained in here up in these two nodes. And this was just a dump pipe moving data to the site. Okay, that's the version three, which was, it, it saved about a hundred cycles versus the previous uh, worst case solution, but it only saved about 30 cycles versus the best case solution. But then I started realizing that there's a lot of empty space that I could use and I could just further parallelize the solution and I could draw some things out. Okay, so let's actually get into it. We have a left lane, we have a middle lane and we have a right lane. And there is a stack memory node in here, but this could might may as well have been a normal node that all it does is to move up, down. That's all it's being used for. For the rest, it, it is a stack memory node, but it's basically it's just in the way. I'm not using it for that function. So that's just a, a quick aside. Okay, so these numbers, I've labeled the logic up here to indicate where the numbers need to go. Because these two nodes just divide the numbers. So the first time through, we are going to send data through the middle path. So the number from A, we take it from up and we send it to the right. In B, we take the number from up and we send it straight down. After that, we take the number that left just got and we send it also down. So this node has A and B. At this point, these two nodes are free to send data to another pipe. So we send it to the left. So we take the number from up and we send it down. And then we wait for data from the right side and we send it down as well. So that's what we do here. We take the number from up and we send it to the left. Okay. After this, we want to send data over to the right side because this is just another parallel, not a parallel processing pipe. So we take another value from up, we send it to the right. Well, this one also sends its own value to the right and then it takes a value from the left and it also sends it to the right. So each of the three lanes just get two numbers in sequence. So that's all how they work. And with the, let's see, and this is the probably the purest solution. Because the middle one, the bottom node, it has some logic in the end to also combine numbers from the left and the right side. So it's slightly more complicated. So let's go with the left one. So again, we take a number and put it in an accumulator. Then I've added another feature which is early termination detection. Because the thing is, if you do zero times something, that is nothing. If you do some, something times zero, that is also nothing. Um, so normally you would only do an automatic zero check on the value that becomes your counter because you count down to zero. So if that value starts at zero, you're already done. So I've added an, an early termination check in there just to uh, also terminate on the other number because it's kind of a waste of time if you try to add the number zero eight times because that's going to be zero. And it will be a lot of cycles that you waste otherwise. So this early termination check, it, it actually helps quite a bit. I think it's, it's one of the... Well, it helps a little bit, uh, put it that way. Uh, I don't think it was actually that massive in the bigger picture because it's 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 a little bit of overhead and in case you are adding like uh, six times five, you are doing an early termination check that doesn't do anything. So it's a, it's a wasted cycle when you don't need it. But the more times there are zero values, the more times it will actually save you uh, crunching through numbers that no, don't need to be crunched. Um, and in case that we are done early, we just take the second input and we just discard it. So we do an up nil 
to take to ignore the second value. Okay, so we if we don't do that, then we have just moved in the first number to the accumulator. Then we swap them, so the first number goes to the to the backup, and then we take the second value and we put it in the accumulator. So at this point we have the first and the second value in here. And then we go on to the main loop. So we check the accumulator value for to see if we are done. If it's empty, we are done. Otherwise we subtract one to always make sure that already happened. Then we swap it back in. So then the recently decremented value goes to bug, the bug value goes to ACK, at which point we can just output it twice to the counter, after which we swap them back, so the counter value is back in ACK, and then we do a jump to main. And that just keeps repeating because there is a ter uh, termination condition here, with the jump of equal to Z done. And that, I, I think I tried inlining it, but with the early, termina early termination detection, I, I needed some extra space and you, uh, you need to jump to done anyway. So this is in between. Before that, it was uh, the jump of equals to zero. It actually had one line at the beginning and then it just had, the, had it inlined as well in the end, rather than a jump to a check. So that's also a, a small price. That's why the early termination check, it's, it's a trick I wanted to show, but its effect is severely diminished because you have to work around it quite a bit. Okay, so we've just been sending out numbers and that's at some point that stops, we are done and we send out negative one. And then we have our uh, adder thing, which starts out, it takes a value from up, puts it in the accumulator. Then if it's less than zero, meaning if it's the negative one that we are looking for, then we jump over to done. Otherwise we swap out the sum value, which always starts at zero because of the bug. Then we add the second value we get, we swap it back, we jump to main and it keeps looping. And the moment we are done, we swap out the sum value in bug back to ACK and we send it off uh, to the right. And then we put in a zero and we save it to clear it and cycle back. It's, it's the same old accumulator. In this code it runs here, it runs here and it runs here. Only addition being that the middle node, because the output is below it, it first processes the middle values. After that it takes the value from the left and sends it out and then the value from the right and it sends it out and only then will it start processing it again the middle values. The reason for this is because that's also the order in which the data got sent in. So middle gets the data first, then the left and then the right. And because we need to keep the outputs in order, we need to ensure that the ordering always stays the same. Yeah, and there's one node here unused. And these two nodes are only half used and I've been pretty liberal with my use of labels. So I, I basically I only needed four and five instructions. But if I wanted to Maybe with a lot of work and a lot of complications, it is possible to add a fourth parallel processing lane to it. I personally haven't been able to do it yet, but if I look at the scores, I mean, this is ridiculously fast compared to previous solutions. This is it's like 60% of the runtime. I mean, it's less than a thousand rather than 1500 instructions. But I'm only here. There are people who have done it even faster. I mean, I'm thinking this is, this is about 1200, this is 1000, 800, uh, this is a 650, 700 range. So some people really did it even faster. Maybe they used multiple, uh, they maybe they used another one. Maybe they had a, a slightly more efficient process. If you see the, the runtime, this is idle 26% of the time, 32% of the time. So there is a bit of waiting in between everything. And especially because everything needs to say lockstep in sync. Um, no, why not any? That's good. Actually, now that I think of it, early termination is useful if it's not a blocking factor, right? And in this case, 
only if all three the parallel processes will terminate early at the same time will it be useful because all three processes will be as slow as the slowest of the three because they need to wait on each other this is the blocking factor here the middle middle lane can't resume processing until the left and the right are done so at some point once this one starts sending data out to downstairs it's going to block until this one is actually ready for the data but i've been thinking what if i take the early done out so we take out the, the early done um yeah so we'll take that let's uh, do some live coding here so in that case, well, uh, worst case, we multiply zero by eight, uh, eight times. Uh, that's sure. That, that's not going to be too much of an issue. Because then we can take the early done code out. And at this point, we have uh, a main that's jump if equal to zero done. So if it's jump if not uh, equal to zero, or jump if it's not zero, to main. And then what we can do is we just move main up one place. So the init code will have uh, an extra check, jump if it's equal to zero. And afterwards we will just move down. So let's see if this still works. This still works, 958. That's actually slightly faster. The nice thing is all of these nodes, they kind of work the same. So in here I can just uh, add it as well. And here I have Rather than taking value from up, uh, it needs to come from the left side. And this is left. And then uh, no, there is no early termination, so there's only two things. So this is going to be even faster. 882 with 74 instructions. So was it 882? So oh, that's uh, version 4.2. So it's now even faster. So it's it's closer, but again, there is still space for improvement. So maybe there might be a way to just improve on this design by inlining some things, or maybe you know, maybe there is a better way to do the in-place addition or things. Because you see now that. This one is idle 70, 37% uh, of the time, 48% of the time. So maybe this this massively parallel thing is blocking too much. Maybe there's a better way to to do it. I uh, I'm not quite sure of it. So, uh, uh, but that is what I had to say about this puzzle. So this was the, the signal multiplier. Um, as always, if you have any input, any feedback, any suggestions on how to improve it, um, let me know in the comments below. I mean, I'll appreciate it and other people watching this video in the future, scratching their heads on how to further improve it, might appreciate your feedback as well. And with that, I'm gonna thank you very much for watching and hope to see you again next episode. Bye bye.